Good evening. It's so nice to see all of you here. Most of you are friends, and maybe there are a few new friends here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle Bartlett, fortunate to be the Director of Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning here at the University. And this really begins summer 2014. This summer we have, in addition to 300 courses we're offering, we have 47 different events that are going to be happening on this campus this summer, only two of which you have to pay for. Okay? The odds are really good <laughs> that there will be something there that you will enjoy. Monday nights is a hands-on science and, uh, program for families. Bring your kids, bring your grandkids. It's going to be up in the Reichert Building. Tuesday night, Healthy Living Lecture Series. Those of you who were there last year know how much we enjoyed it and it was so popular. It sort of filled like this is this evening. Wednesday night, Discover Alaska Lecture Series right here. And Thursday night will be Music in the Garden, Georgeson Botanical Garden with live music. So those are the, you know, the things that are going to happen weekly. We have the Legacy Lecture Series, which will be happening on the 2nd of June. It's, a, it's honoring Helen Atkinson. Helen Atkinson was the first woman that graduated from the University of Alaska with a degree in engineering. Okay, and um, we, were on, we are honoring Helen. Uh, Helen would have been 99 this month. Unfortunately, the, unfortunately, she passed away. But the good news is, the very good news is, because she was 99, or she was going to be 99, and we film the lecture, and it's like a, a Charlie Rose event, we sent the film crew to Wasilla where she lives, or she was living, and we recorded the whole thing in March. So we will be able to honor Helen on the 2nd of June, and I invite you to come back and, and see the film that she did. Okay? We have the two paid events that we have going on this summer is um, Ari Hest, which will be here on the 6th of June. Those of you who were at the Judy Collins concert last year, he opened for her and he was such a smash. We all loved him. We said, you've got to come back and do your own concert. So if you haven't bought a ticket, do we have them tonight, Charu? Yes. She'll, she'll be glad to sell you one. Okay, 6th of June. 6th of June. And um, from NPR, we have... Neil Conan is actually teaching a class this summer, but in addition, he's going to be joined by Ken Rudin to do um, a program on the political junkie. Now, this is a political season. Our airways are getting, so we're going to have a good time of laughter and looking at politics in America, and that is going to be in July at Wood Center. So these are things that are coming up. All right, but tonight, but tonight, we have opening our series is Ambassador Alan Katz. And I was on Charlie O'Toole with him this morning, and he said to me, how did you get Alan Katz, the ambassador, to come? <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who aren't in the know, Ambassador Katz is my baby brother. <laughs> so in my introduction tonight, it's going to be a little bit different than you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alan, uh, our parents, my father, our father was born in Germany and our mother came from Chicago. They met during the war. They moved to St. Louis where Alan was born. And uh, we grew up in um, a loving home, but our father traveled a lot because he had to support his, his family. Alan went to the University of Missouri at Kansas City where he got a degree, I believe, in American Studies. Do I remember that correctly? It's close enough, right. <laughs> and then he was going on to graduate school, a graduate school in history at the University of Toledo in Ohio. But he dropped out after one semester because he said, with, with Kuda, uh, Mary Mandu, so where are you? Not Mary, uh, Mary Erlander. Where are you? Right here? OK. He said, the thing about academia is you have to, your, your big thing is going to publish. And he said, who's going to read it all? You know? 
<laughs> so he went, he went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and went to law school, started there, but has been, always been very active in politics, but behind the candidate. And he helped Bill Gunner from Florida get elected. And so he switched after a year and a half, went to Washington, D.C. with Bill Gunner, who won, and he be, worked in his office and finished his degree at American University. He went on to be an uh, assistant insurance commissioner for Florida, established a very <coughs> successful law firm there. Um, and then in, President Obama nominated him to be the ambassador to Portugal. You know, it's really an exciting thing. We are first generation, he and I, Americans, because our father was really thrown out of Germany. And he went back and represented America to Europe. He was there for three years with his wife, Nancy Cohn, right there. And I'm telling you, without her, he wouldn't have done what he has done. So I really <laughs> thank you, Nancy. A wonderful mother and two great kids. His three year stint in Portugal, he accepted a distinguished professorship back at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Would you help me welcome my brother? Can you hear me in the back without this microphone or not? No, no okay, I'll definitely hear me. In the back. Okay, good, okay. First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for that kind of introduction. When you said hang on to your seat, all I can think of is remember I get the last word. But uh, it's very, very nice to be here. It's uh, nice to uh, be greeted on this beautiful campus. I uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, having the chancellor here. I appreciate uh, uh, the rest of my family here, uh, uh, Bill and Aaron. It's very nice to have you both here and my wife. Who, uh, What Michelle didn't mention was, aside from the fact that uh, Nancy and I have been married for 37 years and she has been the person that I've been able to uh, depend upon for any number of things through that period of time, that the unique aspect of Portugal, which made it even more special, was that she speaks Portuguese. And there had never been a wife of an American ambassador who spoke Portuguese before. And as I tell the story, when we first got there, we would be invited to these dinners, and everyone was sitting around, and we would walk in, and Nancy would begin speaking Portuguese to them. And I, by the way, my Portuguese was, I took Portuguese lessons all the way through. My Portuguese got up to almost not too bad. But, <laughs> so in the first few months we were there, we would go to these dinners, and everyone would be talking away, and then suddenly they would look over at me, and they would say, doesn't he talk? <laughs> and so what happened, of course, was is that they took pity on me from time to time and moved into English, and I worked on my Portuguese. Uh, let me tell you that there are, uh, actually what I want to do tonight is this. I'm going to talk for a while. Uh, I'll try not to bore you. I've got some slides that, I, that are more for uh, inf a little information, hopefully somewhat humorous, but hopefully will give you an idea of where I'm trying to take this conversation. Uh, when I'm through with that, I want to open up the floor for questions, and the questions can be on anything that I'm talking about up to and including what's it like to be an ambassador to the things that I think is more important that I want to talk about, which is where this country is going and where I think we need, we all of us have a responsibility to try to take it. Uh, when, I was in, when, I was, when I first came to Portugal as the ambassador, one of the first things that you do is you present your credentials. And they have a very elaborate ceremony because Europeans are more elaborate in their ceremonial approach to these things where they literally, you, you, you're, you're driven to the palace of the president uh, you call colors are presented, the national anthem of America and Portugal is played. Uh, there are horses, there are soldiers on horses, and it's a very elaborate ceremony. And what happens really is, what happened to me at least was, is that I really became very uh, emotional. Uh, I grew up at a time in the 60s when the American flag had become a political symbol in this country as opposed to a patriotic symbol. And it became to, to, to part to certain people. And so those of us who so were, were on the left in those days, the flag waivers seemed to be on the right. So therefore, a lot, a lot of the attachment to the flag that we would have normally expected to have in the country, even though you consider yourself very patriotic, you didn't have. So when I stood there in the courtyard and they bring the American flag out, and I feel tears coming down my face, I knew this was a special time. 
And as Michelle said, you know, the fact that our father had had to escape Nazi Germany, uh, having been in a camp, and his son goes back as the ambassador to uh, the United States. This only happens in America. It doesn't happen anywhere else. So that whole process began for me, and I began to understand what I learned more about in this role than I'd ever, than anything else that I learned, and I learned a whole bunch of things, was how America is viewed by the rest of the world. And it's easy in the midst of all the things we don't like, all the problems that we have, to forget that we are indeed the beacon of hope to the world. They look to us as being the city on the hill, in spite of all of our problems. They look at us as the place that is the cradle of democracy in the world. And what I used to say to my friends in Portugal, who come from a country that the borders haven't changed for essentially 900 years, uh, I would say, you're a very old country and we're a very young country. But they had a revolution in 1974. I said, you're a very young democracy, and we're a very old democracy. And they said, that's why we look to you as a democracy on how we should really go forward. So when I look at how we are proceeding in our country today, it's not just that I get frustrated and I don't like certain things that I see, but I keep, in, I keep the sense of responsibility that we have, not just to ourselves, not just to our communities, not just to our children, but for the rest of the world. Because we really are looked to as, okay, how do you do these kinds of things? And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is how I think we got to the place that we're in, which most people don't like, and how I think we might move to change that situation. Let's talk, and in order to do that, you, sort of, you have to realize where we started or, or how we got there. So I use the first slide here, is, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands. In 1964, the United States Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. And for a show of hands here, how many people here think there were more Democrats voting for it than Republicans? Raise your hand. You think more Democrats voted for it than Republicans? Okay. And how many of you think more Republicans voted for it than Democrats? Very intelligent crowd. <laughs> Because as you can see, what happened was, in 1964, 80% of the Republicans in the House voted for this. 82% of the Republicans in the Senate voted for it. In fact, it was the Republicans that were absolutely necessary to break the filibuster. Now, do you really, if the same bill were on the floor of the House of Representatives today, how many of you think that more Republicans would vote for it than Democrats? And I say that not to point the finger at Republicans, I say to talk about the fact of how we have changed and what some of the real, real problems are and how we need to sort of to, to, to move forward. Now, there's a book written by a man named uh, Bill Bishop, it was called The Big Sort. And he points out several things that I didn't realize. In 1976, approximately 25% 26% of Americans live in so-called landslide counties. That means a county where 20% or one party or the other won by more than 20%. That means that the people were pretty homogeneous. They basically thought alike politically. And by 2004, it was 48%. Today, it's probably closer to 60%. Now think about what that means. What that really means is, is that the people you spend time around are people that think, just like you do. And what happens is, is that people who are, uh, who have different points of view don't live near you. They don't go to your church. They don't go to your school. You don't have much to do with them because the reality is you don't live with them. You don't live around them. And what we wind up doing is we wind up with this idea that our opinions are facts. And why do we think that? Because everyone we know agrees with us, right? And if we have a problem there, we're not really sure whether we're right. If we're conservative, we turn on Fox News, and boy, you know what? We're right. If we're liberal, we put on a, turn on MSNBC, and we know we're right. So what happens is, is that we continue to reinforce this idea that somehow we're right and everyone else must be wrong. And, and there is this idea of 
that's, that somehow the other guys, if they just sort of would pay attention to what's going on, they would know that we're right. And, of course, the problem is this. Well, let me ask another question. How many people in this room would consider themselves conservative? At the university, okay. Okay. <laughs> how, okay, how many people would consider themselves liberal? How many would consider yourselves moderates? Okay. Now, I want the hands of everybody who doesn't believe that the facts support their position. <laughs> right. Everyone thinks the facts support their position because we all get all the reinforcement that we could possibly ask for. And what happens is, is that uh, we find ourselves ignoring the fundamental principle that Daniel Patrick Moynihan pointed out for all of us, which is we are all indeed entitled in this country to our own opinions but we are not entitled to our own facts. And the problem is, is that we have confused the two and it has created a huge problem. Now it came about for a variety of other reasons too. If you look at the, the movement, the majority of Americans are Protestants. So you look at the Protestant church in this country and what you see happen basically was this. You used to have what was referred to as public Protestantism. That means that the Protestant, mainline Protestant churches were oriented towards reaching out into the community. And there was the social gospel that was carried out and was a basic part of church membership. And what happened really was, is that it changed. And it changed in, in ways because people began leaving the churches, looking for something else, and what did they find? They found the evangelical movement. And the evangelical movement, which provides spiritual nourishment to a lot of people who left the mainline Protestant churches, also had a slightly different twist. And the twist went something like this. The focus is the church. The focus is you individually with the people inside of your church, your relationship with God, that is what is really important. And so we began to find more ways of people kind of sorting themselves out. In other words, you met with people, you spent time with people from your church. You spent time with people who believed the same things you believed. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the impact on our society, a society where until after World War II in the 50s and 60s, social mobility, the ability to move wherever you wanted to move didn't exist because of the economic constraints. But now the economic constraints were gone, you could begin to move. And where did you move? You moved into those places that were, you found people like yourself. So therefore you had, as you can see here, uh, we had more and more homogeneous communities. Now what does that mean? One of the things it means is we have this idea in some quarters that conflict breeds extremism, and that's absolutely wrong. What breeds extremism is homogeneity. It means that everyone kind of thinks the same. And the reason is for that, because if everybody kind of thinks the same, two things happen. Number one, if you're in a community, everybody kind of thinks the same. If you're going to move outside of that, there's a social cost to that, to be an outlier. So if you believe, and let's stop it, I'll do a Democratic and a Republican example. If, I, if everyone in my community believes that Barack Obama is really a socialist and really out to destroy the country, taking one step further, sort of saying he wasn't even born here isn't that big of a jump, but that's where it comes from. On the other side, if I believe as a Democrat that, you know, these Republicans in privatizing Social Security, they really hate old people and they don't really care and they want them to live on dog food, how far, how much of a elite is it? And so what we have is we have this polarizing types of rhetoric that has grown throughout our community. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. All you have to do is turn on the news. And you see it, and you see it every week. And I think that and what we've gone, gone to is trying to figure out what to do with it. So one way people tried to figure out a way to solve the problem was they said, let's give everybody more information. If we give everybody a lot more information, then they're going to say, oh, now I understand it. Now I get it. Now I'm going to agree with you because I get more information. The only, there's only one problem with that. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because that's fundamentally not the way we make our decisions. I have another test for you. Let's suppose that we had a law, in, a new law in this country. Let's say we had a, let's say we had a pickpocketing ep epidemic, okay? Where basically people were getting their pockets picked, their purses snatched, and we wanted to do something about it. And I came to you and said, I've got the answer. Anyone that we catch who's a pickpocket, we're going to chop their hands off has two very good effects. Number one, they're not going to do much pickpocketing without any hands. And number two, what a great deterrent. Now, how many think, raise their hands, that that would be a good idea here? Okay. Okay. 
You always get one or two outliers. Uh, There's a reason he's not from around. But how many of you think it would be a terrible idea? Okay, now, the reason it's a terrible idea is not because it's not a logical, it's, not a, it's a pretty logical way to go about it, right? But the reason is, is that because we don't generally make most of our decisions based on logic. We like to think we do. We like to think that we are sort of really, these very, particularly at a university campus, we're really logical people, we are smart, and we can, we can wade through all the evidence and that's the conclusion we come to. The problem is, is that most evidence indicates that's not the case. What it indicates is that most of our decisions are made emotionally, intuitively. I mean, take this example I just gave you. Intuitively, you're sort of repelled by the idea, aren't you? And, and what happens is, is that from a value standpoint, it just it doesn't fit in with how we see ourselves. And this little example that you see up here of a guy, of a, a, someone riding an elephant, comes from a book written by Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. And he uses this as an example to demonstrate what I just talked to you about. If the elephant, or your emotions, and your intuition, your values, what really sort of motivates you, but what the rider is, the rider is your rational mind. Now what's the rider doing? The rider is not directing which way you go. The rider is rationalizing which way you're leaning. You're leaning left, the elephant's leaning left, you're leaning right based on things that have nothing to do with your mind. And what are we doing as a society in trying to solve our political problems? We're all yelling at the rider. The rider doesn't have anything to do with what the elephant's doing. All it's doing, the rational mind, all we're doing is we are justifying whatever it is that's going on. Now, you want to know how far we've come? This is the vote on the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. Okay? Now, remember, back in the Civil Rights Bill, we had a pretty uh, bipartisan consensus. Now, the number of Republicans in the United States Senate who voted for Obamacare was, anybody know the number? Zero. Okay. Number of members of the House Republicans who voted for Obamacare. Anybody know the number? Zero. Right. Okay. So now, think about it. One of two things has happened. Either we have so evolved as parties that we are so partisan, so locked in that not one Republican I don't mean, I mean, not one Republican voted for this, okay? And the question really becomes, was it because they really thought it was the worst idea in the world, every single one of them? Or was it because we reached a point where where it comes from is what determines what we do? And by the way, this just happens to be something, when I could have bought you something when George Bush was president, and you would have had an almost identical situation on the Democratic side. This is not something, this is not, this is not a Republican problem, this is not a Democratic problem, this is an American problem. And unless we do something about it, things are only going to get worse. So, what to do? The Village Square. Now, the reason you see a flying pig there is because we think that, you know, when pigs fly is when maybe we'll work out this whole problem. But as you can see, this is an organization that we began in Florida about uh, eight years ago. And the idea went something like this. We needed to get together in the same room, Democrats and Republicans, who were going to have a conversation about a very tough issue. And at that time in our community, energy was a big issue. And we had a huge referendum, a huge fight, in the, the uh, city only the electric utility. The question was, should there be a coal plant? All the kinds of, all, everything you could imagine the only thing that wasn't happening was no one was telling anything remotely close to, to coming out with accurate information. So what happened was this was set up and, and people kept saying, well, why are you going to do this and what's really going to happen and how is this going to work? And I kept saying, well, you know, the reason it's going to work is because we're going to sit down in the same room, we're going to feed everybody, which is, you know, which has a tendency to sort of undermine uh, hostility. We're not going to let anyone be uncivil. We're going to have fact checkers in the room so people can't make stuff up, okay? And we're not going to try to turn liberals into conservatives or conservatives into liberals. We're not going to try to convince anybody of anything on any issue. But what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to get people to come together and have a conversation, a place where they can be engaged in what we used to have in this country, in terms of civic engagement. And what we can do is we can take on any issue because we have no skin in the game. 
we were not coming as Democrats, we weren't coming as Republicans, we were coming as citizens of our community. So you could take an issue like, let's see, oh, someone told me that the tax on oil companies are kind of a big issue around here. Uh, and it's, it's going to be up, there's going to be a referendum from what I read in the paper. And so what I, would, what I would suggest to you, unless this community is very different from every other community in America, is the people who are going to frame this issue are the advocates. People who are for it, people who are against it. The people who are for it are going to tell you 20 reasons why you should be for it. The people who are against it are going to give you 20 reasons why you should be against it. And based on who they are, probably more than the arguments, is based on how you're going to vote. And that's part of the problem. What the Village Square does is we create a framework that is not done by the advocates. We create a different frame. We bring in the best argument on both sides. We have a community-based uh, program generally involving dinner or something to that effect where people are sitting there getting to talk to each other. And the people who make the presentations are subject to fact checkers. People get to ask them questions. And when everything is done, let me tell you what the, let me tell you what the real value of this is. When you go home, have you converted one people from one side to the other? Probably not. But is it possible that when you find someone who disagrees with you on an issue, that they're no longer a bad person? Because after all, you sat across the table from them. You just had dinner together. You talked about your kids. You talked about your neighborhood. And when the next person comes along, politician, to say, those of you who agree with me, those other guys, they're a bunch of bad guys. You say, no, no, that's not true. I know they're not bad guys. I just had dinner with Joe. I just had dinner with Fran. I mean, I, I think they're wrong on the issue. And what happens is you begin, slowly but surely, to change the way people approach issues. And so what you try to do is you try to create a comfortable environment, stimulate these uh, a civil exchange of ideas. And what you really want to do is you want to have a whole bunch of different people in the room because the reality is none of us ever talk about these things with people who don't agree with us. Do we? You know, it, there are some exceptions, but clearly as a country we don't do it. There's no space out there for people who don't want to be in the political food fight that seems to surpass as political conversation these days. And so what's happened is, is that we, those of us who are in what I would call the center in America, center left, center right, which represents by almost all polling information, 65 to 70 percent of Americans. We don't have any place to go. And what we've done is we've given, in effect, the microphone to the crazy people. And the crazy people are, are jumping up and down. And what they're doing is they're telling you that these people that don't agree with you are bad people. And if you wonder about that, you can go back to the television shows I was talking about earlier. And you show the television shows, it happens. So what we try to do is we create an environment, a series of programs in the community. And what happens is, is that people can come and they don't agree. They don't have to talk. They don't need to, want to ask questions. You don't ask questions. You want to just come and listen and be part of something. And when you go home, you're part of a community. You're part of something, and you're not being challenged because you don't agree with the prevailing wisdom that may be going on. We really think, and this, this, you're going to start seeing now some pictures. There'll be a few quotes that are going to be coming up. There are. We've been doing this for eight years. And let me tell you the most significant two things that have happened. Number one, in the local community where it is, where it started in Tallahassee, Florida, on their political campaigns, no one runs negative ads. Now, why do people run negative ads anyway? Because they work. Okay? When, when politicians stop running negative ads, you will know not because they stop thinking, or that they wanted to start behaving better, it's because they don't work. Okay? In Tallahassee, they don't do that. And candidates run on, quote, a village square platform, which basically is civility in doing these things. Now, not everybody. It doesn't, everyone isn't nice to everyone. It's not the panacea. It doesn't change everything. But what it does do is this. It's, it's there. It's in St. Petersburg, Florida. It's going to open up in uh, Broward County, which is Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Reed Hoffman, who is the founder of LinkedIn, has given us money. We're starting one in Sacramento. We're opening one in Kansas City, Missouri. There's going to be a national headquarters there. And our goal, frankly, is to begin to change the conversation that goes on in a lot of communities in the United States. And let me tell you why. I believe that when you look at what happens in this country, 
If we want to change what's going on in Washington, we can't look to Washington to change it. Washington will only come, will only change when they believe the country has moved. I'll give you an example. In 2003, there were seven or eight candidates running for president on the Democratic nomination, running for the Democratic nomination to run against George Bush. There was only one of them against the war in Iraq at the time, and that was Howard Dean. All the rest of the war. By November of 2003, having been out there meeting with Democrats across the country, guess what? Joe Lieberman was the only one supporting the war. All the rest of them either had individual epiphanies along the way, or they found out that the country was not supporting the position that they'd taken. So they changed. They didn't change. They only changed because they listened to the country. And it wasn't like they listened to a majority of Americans. It doesn't take a majority. It's tipping points that we see, and we've seen it happen time after time in this country, where things are going along, going along, and suddenly, boom. When it happens, it's like water running downhill. You can't stop it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying, in as many communities as we can, to find opportunities to create village squares where we think the politicians will have no choice but to recognize that, oh, when I go back home and I call everybody that doesn't agree with me a bad person, that's no longer good politics. That's bad politics. Well, what happens? If it's bad politics, they stop doing it. And the only way they will know that is if we have a process going which basically is going to allow them to hear what we have to say. Now, we've got uh, a few quotes here that I just want to people who have been in the Village Square and what they had to say about it. You had the former NEH chairman Jim Leach, a Republican, came, and these are, by the way, these are pictures of actual Village Square programs, and uh, he came down and he saw one of the programs. Uh, David Abshire, who was the ambassador to NATO, came and uh, basically understood that what we were trying to do there seemed to have salience and seemed to have the ability to sort of something different. Because you see there are a lot of groups going on doing things in this country on, in this whole space on trying to increase civility. Everything that everyone does is important. The difference is where this is the only group where people literally were saying get in the same room. Because you see everyone goes online. Think about what you do online. Online it's so tribal, okay? Who do you talk to online? What do you say online? Do you have you have respectful conversations back and forth online on political issues with people? Of course not. What you do is you respond to things that you think are ridiculous, or you talk to your friends to reinforce each other. So really getting in the same room with, the same, with someone who disagrees with you really matters. I mean, it really does matter. It changes things and changes them a lot. Jonathan Haidt, the author of The Righteous Mind, the, the guy with the elephant, uh, Jonathan, who's been on Charlie Rose and is pretty well known in the, those circles, when he came to the village where he looked up and he said, you guys are the only ones that have figured it out. You've got to get all the elephants in the room. The only way people, way people change their minds, the most likely way to get people to change their minds or rethink the way they look at things is by being around other people. And the reality is, is that you can't do it online. You can't do it over the phone. You've got to get in the same room. And that's what changes things a lot. Kathleen Parker, a uh, national columnist, uh, was asked by, you can see here the quote, asked by Brokaw about the kinds of things that need to be done in the country. This was a question of, there was a, there was a, they were having a, uh, uh, a conversation about civil discourse in America. What can we do about it? She thought that the village square, which is what we were doing, uh, made, made a lot of sense. Frank Carlucci, former Secretary of Defense, former head of the CIA, former ambassador to Portugal, I might point out, after the revolution, uh, came and, uh, and basically had this to say about it. And, and again, all these people, what they're saying is this. They're saying our system is kind of broken. They're saying that, you know, this is a big problem. No one that I talk to says, oh, we don't have a problem. Everything's great. We have great political discourse. We have good political debates. We have intelligent decisions being made by informed people. No one believes that. Okay? And so the reality is, what do we do about it? And those of us who don't want to participate in the food fight up until now have just sort of said, okay, fine, the hell with it. I don't want to, I don't want to it. Okay. And so the other thing we've done with the village square is this. Which, and the question is, ultimately, how do you get people in a community to come out to something like this? I mean, why would they do that? They work all day. What the hell they want to go sit there? So you have to make it fun. 
and you have to make it cool. And so what you do is you have programs that basically attract people in the same way that a lot of other programs do. And what we don't do is we don't make anybody work. So someone says to me at the end of these things, what is, okay, so you've done all this, you've worked in this, you're in all these communities, what's the product? What is the product of the Village Square? And what I tell them all is this, the product is the process. The product is that we need to reinvigorate this, this country of ours with people having conversations who don't agree with each other, but they can do it in a way that is civil and fact-based and enjoyable. And if we don't do that, let me tell you the problem. How many of you have children or grandchildren that are under the age of 20 here? Anybody? Okay. Okay, let me tell you, let me tell you what's going to happen if we don't do something about this now. What they see on television, what they read in the newspaper, and they, they think this is the way it's always been. They think this is the way it's supposed to be. They don't see anything really wrong with it or right with it. They may not like it, they may, but because to them, that's all they know. So unless we change this, then basically when we're all gone, what really made this country, which basically the, the, the founders of the American country, the people, the, the geniuses that created this country, these people counted on the fact that there was going to be this interchange, that we were going to be able to disagree with each other agreeably. The idea of the name of the village square was, was, was taken from uh, Albert Einstein, who he said the best ideas will be brought forward to the village square, and that's where they'll be judged. In other words, people can't be afraid to bring their ideas forward. And if they are afraid to bring their ideas forward, what they can do now is they can go on television, they can jump up and down, and they can rant, and they can call people who disagree with them names. And that has become acceptable. So, what I'm going to close with here, if I can figure out how to do this. Nah. Wait, 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 wait. Not go away. We've got to do this. And now if I do, how many of you have heard of George Schultz? Okay, for those of you that haven't heard of George Schultz, he served in five cabinet positions, including Secretary of State to Ronald Reagan. I met with uh, Secretary Schultz, talked to him about the Village Square, and this is what he had to say for everybody about. The world we live in has changed remarkably for many past years. The big revolution is the new age of information and communication. People everywhere can have an idea of what's going on, and they can communicate with each other, and they can organize. What does that mean? It means that the diversity, which is characteristic of all societies, the diversity can't be ignored or suppressed. It has to be accommodated. And how do you do that? You do that by talking with each other, by solving problems, by working them out, usually at the most fundamental level, right where you live. So that's the old-fashioned way. Here we are in our community. We get together in the village square. And we talk about the problems, whether it's snow removal, schooling, or whatever it may be. And that can build up. So instead of always thinking of a, a big national event that cascades down to everybody, maybe we should think more about all sorts of little events all over the place, reflecting people's views and their necessities where they live, and have that work its way up and get itself built into some sort of a consensus. That's the idea of a village square. So let's try it. Who knows? Guess my work. Thank you all very much. Now I've been told that, that uh, we now go into question and answer phase, so uh, any question that you want to ask, all I can do is promise to Try and answer. Yeah. Well, I'll just comment. I mean, the goal here is admirable, 
to actually have people be civil to each other and talk. And you see a lot of change happen when, uh, for example, Cheney changed his views on, on, on gay marriage when he found out that there was somebody in his family who had that same issue. Uh, but the overall, at least at the national, certainly at the national level, the perniciousness of money in politics, and it's not getting any better from the recent Supreme Court rulings, you still have, if somebody's going to run for an office and trying to actually accomplish something, they may talk to people, but then they have this pressure that comes down to behave in a certain way or to vote in a certain way. I'm trying to figure in my mind how long it's going to take to transcend something like that. Well, uh, the question is, given, given the amount of money that is in, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, the amount of money that is in politics, how do we ever sort of uh, get past that and have, in, in terms of approaching the issues without that affecting how, how people behave? Is that a fair characterization? Oh, sure. uh, I think the answer to the question is, there are a couple of things I think we all need to recognize. There's always been a lot of money in politics. <coughs> Uh, there's always been a lot of money by people who have a lot more money than the rest of us in politics, okay? Now, we're talking about sums today that are, you know, sort of mind-boggling, but on a relative scale, there were some fairly mind-boggling sums that go back to elections in, in this country as well, and oftentimes for elections that uh, didn't turn out so well. For example, I don't know how many of you realize this, but in 1964, when Barry Goldwater ran against Lyndon Johnson, he raised more money than Lyndon Johnson. And he lost all. He lost all the five states. What I'm trying to say is, is that yes, it makes it hard. There's no question it makes it more difficult. But I think that in the end, what politicians do is politicians chase votes. And when chasing money, if the choice is chasing money or chasing votes, they'll always chase votes. Right now, they see money as the way to get the votes. And so somehow, if the people in their community are sort of saying, no, 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 we, it's great that you have all these ads. This is, this is not what's going to make us vote, vote with you. I'm not trying to dismiss it or sort of say it's not a huge problem. Of course it's a big problem. But, you know, we didn't get this way in a day, a week, a month, or a year. And it's unlikely we're going to get out of this in that period of time either. But we have to start somewhere. And the only thing that I can do is that we can't, no one can, the, look, the other side wants to raise a lot of money. It, it, it depends on where you're sitting again. You may think that Tom Steyer and the amount of money he's going to put in because of the pipeline is awful. You may think that the Koch brothers and money they're going to put in is awful. It doesn't, wherever you sit, if, if you're looking, if the question is, is there too much money, the answer is of course, but that's not going to change. So we have to do what we can do. And I think that in the end, if you look at Washington, you look at power in Washington and elected officials over this whole continuum of, of time, what has been the most important thing is not doing things that may make them lose their, their job. And right now, they may think it's funny. We need to change the mind. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, this is more of a comment than a question. I've been looking around for Bill or Nancy Mendenhall because I, I'm past chair of the Alaska Democratic Party, the National Committee man sitting over there. and. And what, what Gary's mentioning about money, uh, I agree with you. It's not money. It's, it's more of a sense of industrial politics. Because it's very easy now to disseminate a message. And the message is, of course, vote for our guy, don't vote for the other guy. And I don't know, is this working? Yes, no. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, the problem is... Uh, well, and it's not a problem, it's just by its nature, partisan politics, we exist to elect uh, the guys we like to defeat the guys that we don't like. And that's always been that way. But it's so easy to send messages uh, to literally millions of people electronically through social media. And because we've had wealthy Democratic supporters uh, George Soros certainly uh, would fit that category, and so I, I think that uh, uh, I, I agree with you there. It's not just money, uh, but the opportunities to have non-industrial politics, to have face-to-face -face discussions that are lacking, and that's where perhaps the Village Square fills the vacuum. 
Yeah, just uh, let, let me just a uh, brief comment. Basically, is is that you know there I can I can assure you that I can give you as many reasons why there are problems as anybody else can out outline here. You know, unfortunately, I've been in, around politics and government most of my adult life, so I, I'm aware of that. I, but I'm more aware of how dysfunctional we've become, and we need to do something about it. Do you have a question? Yes, sir. What, can, you, can you give him the microphone to, if we can pass it up? We're just trying to, I think they're trying to just kind of record all this, so we're trying to get everything down, and I won't have to characterize your question. I understand you to say that the politician will respond to the voters. Then perhaps you could comment on the fact that uh, I believe about 70 percent of the voters supports to raise the minimum wage to ten dollars and ten cents, and still you see no action by the legislators. Okay, that's, that's a good question, and let, let me so, let me make a couple points here that I think we need to keep in mind. First of all, you know we get, we live in a society now where there's like a poll a minute. Okay, I mean, so you, I can't expect the politicians, nor nor should we want our elected officials to respond to every poll that comes out because, frankly, they come out too often. Uh, in terms of anything around cogent policy, see, I would say the same argument is true as it relates to gun control. You know. Uh, 70% of Americans believe there should be more uh, control on, on handguns than, than the law just, it continues to happen. What we see electorally, of course, what happens is, is that uh, there are issues that are so, such hot button issues for certain voters, but not for others. In other words, take your example of raising the minimum wage. Uh, the real question is, is how many people are going to vote for someone, not vote for someone, because it's the most important <coughs> issue to them. That becomes, for the political reality, of what you're talking about. But I will tell you something else, too, is that one of the advantages of programs like the Village Square are they take those issues and instead of sort of saying, I'm a Democrat and I want to increase the minimum wage, I'm a Republican and you're going to cost jobs if you do, which is sort of the, you know, you know, basically the way the argument goes today is something like this. I'm a Republican, so I'm against raising the minimum wage because it's going to cost people jobs. I'm a Democrat. The reason the Republicans don't want to do this is because they hate poor people. Okay? Now, that, that's unlikely to resolve itself in, in any kind of constructive way. There are good arguments on that particular issue that both people can make working from the same set of facts. But that's the conversation that's never happened. And we try to do, and the idea of the village square is let's have a place for that conversation to take place. And uh, sometimes we do it better than others. Yes, ma'am. I think it's a great idea, the village square. And so I wonder if in Tallahassee, when you have these village square, were you somehow able to affect the uh, political figures on a national level? I mean, I can see in a community how great this would be to try and solve your problems, lots of problems. But how do you get that up to the national level? Well, the way you get it up to the national level is you have it in 50 communities or 75 communities, or 100 communities. There's a point out there. And what happens is, is that, you know, I talked to Congressman uh, Emanuel Cleaver, who is a uh, congressman from Kansas City, and I said to him, I said, Congressman, what would, in your opinion, happen if suddenly the way this, these debates go back and forth, Democrat and Republican, were going to cost people their seats, potentially? How quickly would they change the way they, they conduct themselves, he said, like that. So it's not so much, see, we're, this is not about turning conservatives into liberals or liberals into conservatives. This is about making people have a real conversation. And you force them because the community's demanding it. You're not demanding that they agree with you on the minimum wage, but you may be demanding that they come and they have a real conversation about it. And they tell you why they're voting one way or voting another way. Now, there are certain institutional roadblocks that exist in terms of individual pieces of legislation. And we talked about the Civil Rights Act here when this talk started, and we had a bill busted in the Senate, and only, and frankly, only mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson could have passed that bill. Without Lyndon Johnson understanding the Congress as well as he understood it, that bill would have never passed. If, if it would have passed, but it would have been much further down the road. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. right, I know you want to cut hands off. What else? <laughs> I lived in the Muslim country, so it's considered reasonable there. You asked if it was a reasonable idea. Uh, fair and enough. It is a reasonable idea. 
And that's not what I wanted to ask about. I wanted to ask if you agree if, um, uh, with me that the country has shifted greatly to the right. And, and uh, it seems to me the country has shifted greatly to the right, uh, but it's been manipulated to do so. And, and can the village square approach uh, reveal that, or can it address that, or does it have any chance? Because what you're talking about is, sounds to me a little like fair and balanced. And now we're going to be fair and balanced, but we've already shifted way far to the right, and um, that's still not, in my opinion, close to fair and balanced. Well, two things. First of all, you, can't for, you cannot enforce uh, a law that makes people only say things that are true, okay? If we had that, you know, we could probably solve a lot of this stuff. <laughs> but, you know, but, but, I, but although politicians in their own way, really, some, some people argue we get the politicians we deserve, so maybe we should, we should be a little, a little, we should be careful with what we say about them. But I think this, one, I, just, I disagree with your premise, and let me tell you why. I do not believe this country has fundamentally shifted to the right. Uh, last time I checked, in, in 2008 and 2012, this country, by significant majorities, three points, four points, five points, voted for the first black man to be president of the United States. Okay? Now, if you were looking for a, a, a way to demonstrate that this country had moved to the right, that would not have occurred. And I think that, that now, do I think there's a lot of rhetoric? Racism is, is what, the only... No, no, what I'm saying to you is this, is that, you know, the, is that we, the, the, the person who was elected president of this country was you know, is, is a Democrat. I would call him center-left. Some people would call him extreme-left. It depends on where, 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 how you look at things. Uh, some people would call him a centrist. But my point is, is that if the country had moved so far to the right, they would not have been elected. Well, Democratic candidates for president have won the popular vote in this country five of the last six elections. And all I'm saying is, is that that doesn't say to me the country's moving to the right. I mean, because by definition, the Democrats are now are, are, are leftists. No, no, but no, but by, no, but by definition, I think it's hard to argue that when Democrats win elections, it's a sign of the country moving to the right. If you want, if, if, if that if national elections mean anything in terms of the conversation, in terms of the framework that you that you raised, I would say to you, it is more indicative that it's not moving to the right. Not that it's moving to the left, but that it's not moving to the right. So, so let me put it to you this way. Is, are the Democrats of today further to the right or further to the left than the Democrats who voted in, for instance, the Civil Rights Bill? Well, why does that matter? In that that matter. Okay, well, it doesn't matter where you are. We're talking about how to respond. Well, right, 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 right. And, 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 I, and I would say to you, I don't think that's very great change. But I think your point is, is, is the one that's the same one, which fundamentally is we have in this country people all the way across the spectrum. We always have that. We've always had people on the left and on the right who are extreme in their views. But for most of our history, we have marginalized them. Not always the McCarthy or a few other things, but generally speaking, and sometimes they've served very useful purposes. We sometimes people who were way out of sync on the right or way out of sync on the left actually had an idea that was so good that ultimately it kind of worked its way through the process. What we run the risk of today is lacking the capacity to be able to do that because we have turned everything into a zero sum game. If you're for it, I mean, it's, if it's good for you, it's bad for me. And when you think that way, frankly, it undermines everything that makes America unique. Yes, ma'am. Ambassador uh, uh, thank you for coming to Fairbanks and, and talking. Um, you know, what I see as a problem in the public square today and, uh, and uh, the chance for civil discourse is that the, the square has become increasingly hostile uh, and, and to the point where it's, uh, it, it gives me pause to go out and speak in, in the public chamber. Um, our assembly uh, chamber here in Fairbanks is a, is a good um, example. Uh, now I've adopted this sort of mantra of, of um, uh, the opposition is not wrong, they're just less right than I am. 
<laughs> and it's a it's a it's a basis um, or respect to the opposition's opinion, which I think is what's miss is what is missing in, the, in a lot of the um, discourse in the public square today. And uh, you know, I raise this because uh, just the other week, for example, I went down to the borough assembly chamber to testify in favor of the F-35s coming to Fairbanks. Um, and this is a contentious issue for some, and, and some people are, are pretty, um, you know, um, emotional or uh, fired up about it. Uh, you know, I can't make a statement like that without somebody afterwards uh, not coming up to me and talking to my face about their side of the issue, but instead being a passive aggressive off on the side yelling at me. I mean, literally, we're yelling. I mean, it didn't really dawn on me that the person was actually. Um, saying stuff to me until about, you know, 15, 20 seconds later, I discovered that the person was actually directing their comments at me. It was a very strange, very strange experience, but it's not the only time. You know, one time I was there, and somebody got really angry and said out loud, uh, not by the ballot box, but by the musket. Uh, and these sort of comments um, create, but it's not endemic to Fairbanks, though, is the thing. Um, it, it create a hostility in the public square, which I think is what is really eroding our ability to have uh, clear, civil discourse that you're, you're talking about. Thank you very much. And I think, you again, you gave a very good example of my point. The point is, is that there is no space out there right now. And that's what we try to create. And that's what we think every community in America has the potential to create. If you find people who sort of are suddenly saying, I want the ability to go and, and say what I think about F-35's oil tax, uh, health care, gay marriage, whatever it may be, without feeling that I'm going to be attacked verbally. And the reality is is that uh, we used to have that in this country. We really did. Those of you who are my age remember that we used to have that in this country. And unfortunately, it's not there anymore. Yes, thank you for coming to the um, you said this isn't going to change overnight because it took a long time to get this way. What are some successes that you've seen that, um, you know, to keep you optimistic? Obviously, you've got to be optimistic and keep hoping that it's going to happen. Things will be good. Well, let me tell you about one. Uh, we have uh, in Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri is right on the state line between Kansas. Kansas is a very Republican state. Missouri is a Republican state. Kansas City is a Democratic stronghold. So the Democratic congressman from Kansas City is a Democratic congressman from Kansas is a very conservative Republican. And the two of them uh, have started what they call the Civility Caucus. He was in Washington. He was say it's a very small caucus. But <laughs> the idea is, and to watch the two of them talk, and they profoundly disagree on policy issues, but they have enormous respect for each other. They have figured out local area projects they can work on together. And what's happened is, is that they they demonstrate, you know, it, it can work. It can happen. Now, I wish I had more positive examples than negative examples, but I really believe that, you know, as most things are in this country, which makes us a unique country, no one's going to solve this problem for us. We're going to have to do it ourselves. And we're going to have to do it one person at a time, in one community at a time, and it is... So the idea of the Village Square really wants something like this. If we ask people to come and do things to really work out all these problems, you know, no one's going to come, all right, because you work all day. Who the hell wants to go and work at night? You know, it doesn't make any sense. But if you can have a good time, you have something to eat, you can be entertained, but at the same time you can learn something, you can meet, meet people in the community that you normally don't meet, you'll come. And when they do that, you begin a dynamism that gives the potential to bring in your community a place for people to be able to have this conversation. Yes. I wanted to ask you, how, oh. how do you get a diversity of people to show up? What we did, what, I won't tell you how it basically worked. <laughs> We put the first one together. I was the I was the Democrat, and I went to my friend who I used to run with, who was president of the community college. He was a conservative Republican, and I said, "Okay, we're going to do this. You're the Republican, I'm the Democrat, because if we tell people it's nonpartisan, no one will believe us. 
So forget about that. We'll call it bipartisan. We'll recruit a board of six Democrats and six Republicans, which is what we did. And we sat down and said, okay, we're going to put together a program and we're going to invite everybody in the community. And we're going to start with, I went to my friend Bill Law, the Republican, you give me your list, I'll start with my list. And we're going to put this big net out there. And then we're going to have a program. And in the program, what we're going to do is this. The problem is, the first problem we identified was, this sounds sort of like a democratic, liberal, kumbaya, kind of touchy-feely kind of thing, you know? And so the problem is, is that a lot of times you don't get any conservatives to show up because they're going, oh, you know, this is another one of those. So what we would do is we said, okay, we're going to bring in people just on these panels that would sort of initiate the conversation who are conservative, who are well-regarded, who basically, uh, which in most cases meant that I agreed with them on almost nothing. But that was okay, because what we did was is we brought people in to, which gave it an air of legitimacy. They came. Conservatives came. And we, we, there are a whole series of different programs. We started with these dinners, the so-called Dinners of the Square. We have a program that they're now called uh, Faith, Food, and Friday, where we have people of faith or no faith at all, as we say, because as if talking about politics wasn't tough enough. And we have clergy who lead these conversations in various parts of the city. So what you need to do is you need to go out there and you need to work hard at creating this diverse group of people. And what you look up and what you realize is we're not getting any people of color. We're not getting any young people. We're not getting enough conservatives. And what you do is you change your program and you work at it. And you work at it. The good thing about these programs, too, they don't cost anything. I mean, the total cost of a village square in a community, including a staff person, for a year is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of forty thousand dollars. And what we do in Tallahassee, we run twenty programs a year, and that's what it cost. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've recently be, um, been introduced to some concepts. I've been studying some organization systems, organizational relationship systems, uh, coaching, and so two concepts that I have found to be very helpful is every every voice in the system needs to be heard. And everyone is right, only partially. We could have a great village square about whether everyone is right, even, <laughs> even partially. <laughs> but, it would, but you know, it would, but I understand. It's that, very respectful. You no. come in with believing everyone, every, every voice needs to be heard, and everyone is right, but only partially. And, some, and, and looking for the 2% truth. You might totally disagree with somebody, but if you really say, but is there 2%, 2% that I can agree with or see some truth in, again, you're coming from this respectful place. I think that's exactly right. But that's something over there. Over there. That's right. Behind you. Is that working? Can everybody hear us? Yeah, yeah, it's working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with your diplomatic experience in Europe, uh, do they have any similar type of programs or any other ideas, positive or negative, that you've encountered without getting yourself in hot water? No, no, no that, that's a good question. Uh, you have to realize that the level, the, if you look at Europe and you look at most many countries in Europe with the exception of uh, the UK and a few others, they're relatively young democracies as well. I mean, they don't have the kind of democratic traditions that we have, which is both good and bad. You also don't generally find, again, with some obvious exceptions, France being one, but certainly in Portugal and in other places, the differences between the parties are very, very small. Uh, Portugal, for example, you know, I used to the joke I used to tell was that the Portuguese have uh, that the, that the right wing part, the right wing party of, of Portugal was sort of. Uh, they were kind of at the same level on the right as Arlen Specter was, you know. And the left wing was more like Leon Trotsky because they had communist, remember the Communist Party still in the parliament. So that was, the, so you had a very narrow range. And in fact, there's, there's a great, there was a great quote I was reading the other day that someone in 1958, 59 went to Richard Nixon, who was vice president at the time, and said, wouldn't it be better in America if all the liberals joined the Democratic Party and all the conservatives joined the Republican Party? And he said it would be the worst thing that could happen to America. And they said, why? And he said, because the consequences of the election would be so huge that one of the great things of our country is we have elections. We have huge shifts in power in a very orderly way. And the consequences and the differences, at least in the past, have been 
more on the margins than, 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 than to, with some obvious exceptions with some watershed elections. So basically what Europe has done is they've, 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 they haven't gotten to our point yet. You know? they, haven't gotten, they haven't reached our level of civilization yet. So they haven't, and, and, and actually I've talked to several people over there about what we're doing at the Village Square and they're very intrigued to see whether it helps them on the whole question of just uh, civil society. But now Parliament, generally European right. governments are parliamentary. Right. Here it's first past the post and that's why it's a two-party system. When you have three candidates. Right. Right. No, no, it, it, it's a different system, although you, all I'm trying to say is, is that some of the issues are there, but they have some very tight controls on the campaigns, too, in terms of money and in terms of what you can and can't say. They don't have, they don't have this troublesome thing called the First Amendment. <laughs> yes? So, like, you've been talking a lot about parties, but sometimes the differences seem like they're more regional in nature, like as Republican from Massachusetts is nothing like a Republican from Alaska. In fact, you know, sure Mark Begich would be a Republican in Massachusetts. <laughs> so, and, and like, NPR had this story about how there are different Americans, you know, like the Northeast is a very different America, the Midwest is a different America, the South is a different America. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think so. I think, I think, it's, I think it's a very good uh, question, and I think it's very true that we do live in... Uh, a country with over 300 million people who live uh, very different lives and, and have very different values. Uh, but you know, sometimes people can sort of transcend that because there are certain, certain values, I think, that, 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 that we like to think of as Americans that we have no matter where we are, whether we're conservative or liberal, whether we're in the East, North, South, or West. There are certain things that make America, we think, different and unique. And, and the, and the the problem that I think we're running into is, is that people who don't share our views in other areas, we're beginning to question their commitment to core values in this country. And I think that that is what really is the biggest danger that we have out there. And I, and I think that really can't undermine us. We have to recognize, you know, you, use your example of Senator Begich, Begich, is that how it's pronounced? Uh, who is, and that would, same would be true of a number of Democratic senators who run in uh, more conservative states, but the same would also be true, you know. I mean, you had Scott Brown, who was—I don't know what state he's running for the Senate this year, uh, but anyway. Uh, but but the point is, is that you know he he clearly would not have been elected as a Republican in Alaska. I don't think. I mean, you all tell me, I don't think so. You know, he would have had to get past Joe Miller among other people. But I think that uh, I think what happens is is that. You know, we do have these regional differences, but what we've always been able to do is recognize that underneath it all, there's a certain respect for the rule of law in this country, and there's a certain com common uh, understanding of, of what the deal is. And what I worry about is that that's what's starting to get frayed, and I think that's a big problem. Just a second, somebody with that chance. Yes, ma'am. It may be too obvious to ask question, but I was wondering how you actually keep it civil. <laughs> <laughs> Another very good question. What we have is we have two things at these at these events. We have fact checkers, okay? People and their job is is they're on the they're sitting there on the internet when someone says, and did you know that last year immigration, illegal immigration increased by forty percent? And someone going, No, no, it didn't happen that way. So when people know it's being, their facts are being checked, the tendency is for them to be a little less uh, casual with them, I should say. The second thing is we have what we call a civility bill. So, and, and one person who is, uh, in, my, in my case it was with my friend Bill Law and I, we would each have a bell. And if somebody started to get a little too carried away, someone just hits the bell and everyone starts to laugh and that sort of puts an end to it. Uh, but you have but you tell people in the very beginning, this is the deal, these are the rules, this is how we're going to do this. If you don't like this, you shouldn't be here. And someone said to me, is this for everybody? And I said, well, it's for everybody who wants to come and have a civil conversation. People who want to jump up and down and give speeches, no, they should wait outside, they can have a picket, and they, they can do what they want to do. Yes? Um, how do you reconcile, and, and maybe it's, it's, it's important to have both, the the theme of all politics is local, mm -hmm. and that that makes us 
separate and provincial all over the country. So the Massachusetts and the Republicans, uh, Massachusetts Republican, Democratic Republican, or, uh, excuse me. All politics is local versus the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which is the central theme of American government and justice. And both are true. Well, two things. First of all, I don't think they're inconsistent. Uh, Tip O'Neill is the author of The All awesome Politics is Local, and the reality is this. If your local, uh, if your mayor or your state legislator or your congressman has offended everyone here in the community, he may be striking the, uh, the, the flag for the Republican or Democratic Party, they're going to lose the election. Right. And so what happens is, is they need to pay attention to that. Uh, and really what happens is this. What we hope is that we have politicians who will do two things. Number one, they'll listen to what we have to say and maybe do some of the things. And if they disagree with us, they'll tell us why they disagree with us. And they'll try to educate us. Now, that, it's that second part that we seem to have lost uh, track of. And, and basically, it's something I think we need to be about. I have a concern about um, Village Square working in that the people in this audience may disagree, but we have one thing in common at least, and that is we showed up. And I'm concerned about the growing um, by, by perception, lack of civic interest of people I know, that they regard their personal lives and are not engaged as citizens. So first tell me if, if you think this is a change from 20, 50, or 100 years ago, and if so, how do we get them away from the football game or Netflix or surfing the web or sex in the city or whatever they're engaged in and get them out to join the village discussion? Well, I think two things. First of all, I believe that a lot of people have left the uh, civic, civic engagement because there's no civil civic engagement. So first of all, a lot of people just sort of say, the hell with it all. You know, I'm, I don't want to get involved in that kind of a conversation. So you have to search. First, establish in the community, you know, this is a different kind of deal. This is a different conversation. You get to come. You can be part of it. And, and the other thing is this. You make a really an excellent point. The real problem is this. Whether it's a village square or whatever kind of public... Uh, I mean, my sister got out here and reeled off about a bunch of things that are going to be happening here, right? What's that? Why would anyone come? There would only be there was a competition. What's the choice? Do I come and do I listen to the next speaker, or do I stay home and watch Netflix? Do I go somewhere else? Do I? The only way you get people out is you have to kind of make it fun. Now, I'm not trying to be, say that everything has to be only fun, but what I'm saying is it has to be something that is appealing. If you're working all day, you don't want to come and listen to somebody's story. We, at the village where one of the things we, we, we say is this. We are not the eat your broccoli crowd, okay? <laughs> We're not that. We're not going to tell you, oh, you've got to be more civil, or you've got to do this, or you've got to answer. No, because when you do that, no one comes. Who would come to that? I wouldn't come to it. And so what you really need to do is create an environment in your community. And each community is different. Each community knows what is it that will get someone out of the chair and say, oh, I think I'll go over there because... Sam is there. Basically, the idea initially we had was let's get some people that everyone in the community thinks are cool. They're neat people. We'll get them there. And then say, oh, you know, Jim, I'd like to see them. Or, yeah, oh, he's going to be there. Maybe this is going to be interesting. And we usually have a little thing that sort of makes fun of people like me and others. And that's all. And basically, what happens is, is that you really break down a lot of the barriers that way. But you have to keep working at it. You go to your newspaper, and you go to your public radio station, you go to your, your, your commercial radio stations. You do all the kind of things that you do to build anything in a community. But here, what you're doing is you're saying to people, you can come, you can participate, you can have a good time, you can be heard, you don't have to worry about somebody you know, giving you a hard time while you're there. Now, I think we got time for about two more questions, or we got one more? Two more questions, okay. Do you recommend that you pick some themes for this uh, village square to well, interest people? Well, we, okay, basically, if you, if, well, basically, because we sent them to National Village Square, and, if, and of course I would love for Fairbanks to be a place for, to, to want to open a village square, we will have basically a, a framework that says, okay, here is how we recommend you do it. Here's some programming ideas, here's some structure ideas. This is the way that we think 
you can engage. We have, uh, you, you all got the brochure that was handed out. We got a lunch things like that. And, and really what it is, is the idea is to not, and this is the hard part. Each community is different. And this is essentially a grassroots movement. So you have to figure out what people in this community want to talk about. And if you say it's oil tax, air pollution, air pollution if you say it's immigration, if you say it's gay marriage, if you say it is new sidewalks, if it's snow removal, every community is different. Okay? And what you do, need to do is you need to set up and say, this is what we want to talk about, but it has to be the kind of things that you think you can bring people in who will be able to talk about the pros and the cons, honestly. And what's going to happen is this. Every public issue is framed by advocates. The Village Square is the one place where you get to frame it with no skin in the game. You don't have, you're not on one side, you're not on the other side. You're bringing in the advocates to argue about it, to talk about it, to give the best arguments. But and what's happened in Tallahassee, Florida, after you said, no, it didn't happen in the first year, seven years later. Whenever there's any big public issue, they go to the village, well, would you please have a forum on this? And bring in the, and let each side who says someone in, because the reality is that they know that in the end, they're going to get, they're going to get an honest deal. And what, and see, we have walked, we don't, we used to have that in all of our communities. It was local government, right? It was uh, leading women voters. It was the parent-teacher association. It was something. There were, there were institutions that we all had confidence in. And unfortunately, what's happened is they've all, we've lost confidence in them. And so therefore, we need something new. We need to try to do it. We need to try to do what we used to do so well. And we need to bring it back to our community. Last question. Anybody? If not, oh, there we go. Yes. I've been thinking about this too, isn't it? That the, the labeling, of, labeling of people as liberal or conservative is um, too divisive, and there are better labels. And I think, uh, just a suggestion, I'm thinking of uh, perps and enablers. I'm sorry. Everyone knows what perps are. But for perps, there's usually a whole bunch of enablers that let them get away with what they do. <laughs> and I, I propose if you use this, these terms, perps and enablers, you find a lot of, uh, it crosses the, these old definitions of liberal and conservative. Well, <laughs> I must confess, that's the first time I've ever heard that as a suggestion. Uh, which doesn't mean it isn't a good one, but it, you know, it, it, I, I'm not sure how many people would show up so they can be identified as perps. Uh, as a marketing tool, I would probably try something a little different. But, but I, I do think that there is a, uh, I, I, your, your larger point, which is that, that essentially people uh, have fallen into these labels in ways that adds to the divisiveness is absolutely correct. And, but there, I guess, and in, in, from my perspective, I remember a time when conservatives and liberals could argue all day long and then go out to dinner together. Uh, in the Congress, it used to be that members of the state, same state delegation from both parties used to do things together. They get together with their families, there were events. They don't do that anymore. I mean, literally, they don't do that anymore. They don't work out in the gym together anymore. They don't do the kinds of things that normal human beings do with people they work with all the time. So what we have to do is we have to knock them on, we have to sort of knock on the glass and say, guys, men, women, you're, you're doing this wrong. You're getting it back to where basically we expect certain things of you. We expect certain civilized behavior. We expect you to do things a certain way. And if you don't, then we will find someone who will. They can be from the left, they can be from the right. That almost is less important than people who are willing to participate in what the kind of conversation that made America the country that we all are proud to be part of. Thank you all very much.